Today we're going to talk about Moon Over the Alps, 1960. Um, I have some notes with this particular um, image. The heroine is described, and she describes herself as Penny Plain, and this is not a plain woman. This, this is a woman who knows how to accessorize well. She's had some dental work. Um, anybody with a full head of uh, glorious brunette hair, this is, this, is, this is madness. She might have a touch of altitude sickness. These are crazy eyes up here. But no, she's, she's gorgeous. And so um, it, doesn't quite, it doesn't quite hold true for the, the text itself. But I liked it anyway. Um, I really enjoyed this book. And I thought I'd give you like five good reasons um, why it's so excellent. And one of them is that our principals have really good reasons to distrust one another. They met in this holiday setting and then he thinks that she's a two-timer and she thinks that he thinks she's plain and unattractive. And when they meet again, there's this pr this prickliness and this silence and this this hurt that's between them and it doesn't arise out of nowhere. A lot of times when you read these sorts of books, you'll just, if they're so short that, you know, they just stuff you right into a situation that hasn't had any time to organically grow. And Essie Summers really took some time to lay the groundwork and, and show how wonderful the relationship was, how much hurt had been caused. And then, and then shows them jabbing at each other. And every time that happens, you're just like, oh, and it hurts so bad because it was so good. Um, another reason I really like this book is it does a really great job of painting a picture of this territory, how isolated um, the, the mountains of South Canterbury are and how terrifying it must have been for the early settlers, particularly the female ones. Several of them are described as having lost all of their children through, you know, not having any medical intervention. Um, there's this tragic little story about one of these women settlers um, planting currant bushes to make some jam, and the owner of the station comes and he rips them out of the ground and tosses them over this wall because he can't afford to, to truck in the sugar and he thinks it's too dear. And, and the heroine feels like this sense of anger. You know, a hundred years later, she feels this anger that this ever happened. And, you know, I, I've read too much Essie Summers to think that she didn't read that anecdote somewhere in a pioneer journal or, or speak to somebody for whom this happened to an ancestor. So uh, you really get a sense of how isolated it is. And, and I love how big a part um, the setting plays in in the book. The third thing that crops up, maybe for the first time in any of these books, is the Maori question. And um, one of the sort of tangential characters is going to marry um, a Maori, and and there's some discussion about how fine everybody is with it. And and the heroine sort of holds her breath like, I hope they're not snobs. I hope they're not racist. And, and they come through for her, and, and they're not. And, and I think that that just reflects um, so much of Essie Summers' own feelings about the subject, that she wants to see sort of this racial harmony in this, in this country that's so new and probably has such um, bloodshed and, and history behind it. And, and I kind of, it just, it's just one more thing that sort of makes you feel so, um, so generous and, and sweet with, with S.C. Summers as an author is, is how, how much she's rooting for feelings that we ourselves in this modern era would, would want her to hold. Um, another thing that I really loved in this book, um, that you don't again see a lot in Harlequins of this, of this vintage, and that's, um, friendships between women. One of the great friendships in this is between Penny and Madame Bodine Smith. And, you know, one's in her early 20s and one's in her early 90s and has so much to share and, and tell her about life. And and you just really see this, this lovely relationship flower between them. They spend time each evening for half an hour speaking in French, um, which must comfort the old lady very much and, and also bring a sense of history and and sweetness to the younger one. 
Um, and I love that. There's another character named Verona who gets tossed in, and she kind of she kind of is described as sort of um, Maureen O'Hara, this this sort of auburn-haired, gorgeous model who swans into this sheep station. And instead of being useless and horrible, and she could be a great villain, and she's not that. She becomes this wonderful friend, and and it sets up a dynamic where Penny is anxious not to step on her love life and 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 ruin any chances, even when she thinks that she's the woman that, that Charles is in love with. She's not. Thank heavens. Uh, friendship remains intact. Uh, the fifth thing that I really liked from this book is um, how much um, S.C. Summers excelled at, at keeping that sort of um, tension, tension between the characters. She starts out, again, painting this picture of a really beautiful friendship and romance. And then she snatches that away from you. And she does several things that I think that um, modern authors could still use. And I think that it's it's wonderful in such a small, really small, less than 200 pages book. Um, she she uses some of these tropes. And I'll read, I'll read some of these things. Our, our hero gives backhanded compliments to the heroine. And, you know, as the reader, there's this like zing of hurt for her, you know, and maybe none of the other characters knows what's going on, but they do. Um... There are these sort of fleeting, heartbreaking moments when things are easy between them, and it harkens back to this beginning that they had and, and makes you really want to root for them to get back together. Um, every once in a while, she she has genuine warmth with him and, and tells her that she's very thankful for something that he does, and he just snubs her. And again, it's at that moment where where you, you can see the hurt's still there, it's still underneath. It still needs to be addressed, and it can't just go away. Um, another another uh, trope. Again, these are all sort of tropes that you see, but she employs them in excellent ways. Um, she she has the hero, you know, overhear something that the um, that the heroine says, and um, I love that. I love that. There's this wonderful scene where um, Verona shows up and she's gorgeous and there's Penny grubbing around in the dirt and they're invited in for tea, but such is the level of her hurt. You know, she's been called plain and, and she loves this man and there's this gorgeous woman and so she goes ahead and serves the tea. She, she doesn't change out of her clothes. She serves it and then goes back to grubbing in the garden. And it's kind of this beautiful moment when um, Charles runs out and he is in a fury with her because for him, this is the, the woman that he's in love with and she's treating herself like, like the hired help. And it, the dynamic is really wonderful. All right, one last little thing that I thought was so charming in this. Um, government ministers come in and they get um, stranded and she has to feed them. Penny has to feed them. And one of the things that she feeds them is poached trout. And I don't mean poached as in boiled. I mean poached as in fished for illegally. And um, I thought this was really wonderful because I've been reading snatches of S.E. Summers' autobiography, which I'm going to review at some point, um, but in it she mentions poaching fish at one point, and she's a grown woman and a minister's wife and um, really should feel a lot more guilty about it. She does feel a little wicked, um, but I think they were fish that were going to go to waste anyway. You know, she's she's got her justifications. There's so much of Essie Summers in these books, and I just really love them. This is another winner for me. I, I gave it an 8 out of 10, and um, I look forward to the to the next one. I catch the rest of my written review over at the Uncrushable Jersey Dress, and we'll see you next time.